Martha is a professor and former dean of the Harvard Law School. And in just a few weeks, she will be publishing a book on saving the news. Um, Martha has written about many aspects of public good and public interest in the law. Uh, she has a, a specializations in equal access, equity issues, criminal justice, and other areas relevant to news. And among her many uh, board appointments as a director, you'll see quite a few related to journalism, WGBH, MacArthur Foundation, uh, Carnegie Corporation, CBS, just to name a few. And so this morning, let's I'm sorry, I'm losing Martha in this display. Martha, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I am going to turn over the mic to you to say a few words at the opening about your book and about what brought you to this subject. You've, um, you know, you've written and brought the public so many views of the hottest legal issues and hottest social issues from uh, identity politics to privatization. Why, why news? Why now? I believe that uh, it's not by accident that there's only one private industry mentioned in the United States Constitution, and that is the press. Uh, the framers of the Constitution understood there would have been no revolution without the press, and there would be no possibility of self-government without the press, not to mention uh, the information that people need literally to find food, to f find health. I think that the level of jeopardy right now is dire. And it has been for multiple years. Uh, the pandemic has simply accelerated trends that have led to the loss of what, two thirds of previous journalism jobs. Uh, the employment reductions in newsrooms alone, in newspapers particularly, but across the entire media, uh, it's just so severe. And the replacement with uh, often um, uh, material that is either false or misleading or is masquerading as news, even when it's generated by bots or who knows what. The, this period of internet in disruption takes ad dollars, takes attention, uh, as the intro uh, film so rightly indicated, the use of algorithms even takes away the project of having a shared truth by unbundling content and targeting it in micro ways. So we don't even see the same things, read the same things, know the same things. And then we see the strip mining uh, by private equity of chains of, uh, of news outlets. Uh, th this all adds up to a lack of reinvestment uh, in the daily task of accountability journalism, of finding the news and reporting it. Uh, there are uh, such jeopardy that include uh, Ferguson, Missouri, you know, when the exposés of the horrific conduct there following the killing of Michael Brown emerged. One of the important facts that people don't actually give enough attention to is there's no daily newspaper there. There was no news blog, no, no broadcast media, no community radio. When there is no one watching, bad things can happen. And that jeopardizes public health and public safety, like the opening story about uh, the bent badges. Um, I, I, another uh, reason I wrote this book actually was a conversation I had with uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, the public health expert who exposed the lead in the water story in Flint, Michigan. And I said to her, this is so terrible. She said, well, we were lucky because we had a local news that was vibrant. And then she said something that still haunts me. She says, there are Flint, Michigans all over the country, but people just don't know because no one is there to tell the story. So that's why I wrote the book. We're glad you did. And it will be an important book. I'm going to mention to our audience, you in, in chat and later on the INN site, you will find links where you can buy this book at um, a pretty steep discount, thanks to Martha's publisher. And um, I encourage you to buy this, not just for yourself, for your boards, for your donors. It's a really important 
book in this moment. Um, Martha, you write that without news, we don't have democracy and that the First Amendment has been kind of seen as this barrier between government action and the press. And you say it's not a barrier, it's actually the basis. You then go on to say later in the book, something that is just stuck in my head. Um, you said, if the constitution isn't to be a suicide pact for our yeah. democracy, it has to be used to preserve the news because it has to be used to preserve democracy. Are we being too polite about all this? Do we, do we need to sound a louder alarm? And what do you think will happen in the US if we don't save the news? Uh, I, I know that people find it hard to listen to alarmists. So uh, you all know more than I do about how to be heard and how to be persuasive. But I think that the situation is dire and it's especially dire in the local news world. Whereas Pew uh, researchers and others have exposed the decline and the closing of news outlets in so many communities create literally news deserts where no one is covering the news. Or if there is something local, it's again, recycled features from some kind of a chain that doesn't cover anything local. And yes, I think uh, there are lots of great things about the internet. People can search for information, but finding that uh, important local story or the just accountability of having uh, the public officials and private officials know that there's someone watching them. Uh, that's, that's gonna put us all in jeopardy. It is putting us all in jeopardy. Thank you. So you lay out about a dozen proposals for fixing this. As you said, there's no silver bullet. It's going to take a number of approaches. It's going to go beyond thinking of the state as the only threat to journalism and perhaps looking at platform, digital platforms as public utilities and finding other ways to address this. I wanted to run just quickly as a level set for everybody about the kind of things we're talking about and then we'll dip into a few that either seem um, of particular interest to journalists on this call or things that are maybe coming up in the near term versus long term solutions. So you kind of bucketed these proposals in, in three buckets. Two of them are addressing the digital world, the overall commerce and trust issues around news. And the, the third is about actually supporting nonprofit news, public media and uh, media education in our system. So in that first bucket, we had things like, and this is treating internet platform companies as responsible players. We have things like requiring payment for news circulated on social media and other platforms, payments from the platforms to journalists who produce the content, requiring internet platforms to take on the same liability and responsibility that the news on their platforms is legal as publishers must do, undertake antitrust investigation and possible enforcement, regulate large digital platform companies as public utilities, adopt fairness and awareness doctrines that apply to digital as well as broadcast outlets. Um, the second bucket is vitalizing protections against harm and abuse, things like enforcing contracts, regulating and enforcing fraud protection, requiring transparency about choice, architecture and curation of news. I think you mean the, the algorithms there and we'll talk about that more in a minute and supporting civil society efforts to protect individual internet users. And third, you talk about sustaining nonprofit and varied sources of news and accountability, specifically doing more to support nonprofit news sources with tax exemptions, deductions, credits, fulfill public obligations to public media and media literacy education. Um, so we're gonna dip into a few of these and because this is a conference of journalists and your call for more support of nonprofit and public media is indeed music to our ears. Let's start there of course, and then go into more of the digital world. Why do you see nonprofit and public news support as so key to saving news in the US? Well, I should say, I don't think I'm gonna talk about this book without you at my side, that was terrific. 
Um, what I do know is that the disruptions and the trends are too profound to reverse uh, and maybe even too, too profound to even slow down. We're not gonna reverse them. And there also is a public goods dimension that cannot be solved by the private market. There are market defects here. You know, we see several high visible examples of very wealthy individuals who buy a newspaper or a radio station or a television station. And uh, maybe it's philanthropic or maybe it's to advance their own interests. That is not going to save the news. Uh, and, and same thing with regard to the private market. Um, one of the real problems is that when the internet really took off, uh, not only did uh, conventional legacy media find its content being taken without pay, also the very expectation of paying for the news was eroded, uh, eviscerated by the internet. We all think that we have access to the internet for free. We don't, we are giving our data every minute, but it doesn't feel like we're paying. We're not opening our wallets. And it's been harder, I think, for media to find an appetite for paying for the news. And again, this is a market problem that can't be solved with a market solution. Uh, the fact that some legacy media initially gave away their content is another related problem. Also, we have now generations that are growing up born digital and are expecting to get information at their fingertips at any time. Uh, and it's going to require a, an investment in a kind of public form of the digital architecture that the private sector has so uh, impressively uh, invested in. Um, and, and finally, I think that there's an unbundling that the uh, disruptive technologies have allowed, which again, we're never going to put Tumpty Dumpty back together again. If you can get your sports or your weather just by looking at an app, then you're not going to pay for news that bundles that together with the investigative journalism. Thanks. I want to turn a little bit to the digital uh, side of media and talk a bit about what's sometimes shorthanded is the 230 issue. Um, under the Communications Decency Act Section 230, these digital platforms were allowed to be considered as distributors rather than publishers. So publishers, all of us who publish news, are liable. If we publish illegal content, we are liable. Distributors, such as booksellers, aren't on the notion that they don't control everything and what they're selling or distributing. You write, leaders of digital companies have pretended that their platforms make no editorial choices for which they should be responsible, yet tech platforms fundamentally shape content and intervene to influence what people see through moderation decisions, deletions, highlighting or submerging content, and granting privileged access. In effect, you also say that this protection under 230 is subsidizing the digital platforms in their competition with news publishers who produce content and have that liability. So what do you think can be done to level the playing field and talk a little bit about the political landscape, if you would, is, is this something that actually is moving and could come about? Uh, so changes could come about. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is sometimes called uh, the Bill of Rights for the Internet. Uh, it was, of course, it, it hard to now for all of us to remember a time when it seemed like Internet companies were so fragile and knew that they needed protection. And this grant of immunity from the liabilities that attach to any other purveyor of information was meant to allow the development of these fragile little entities that now happen to be among the best capitalized largest companies in the world. You know, actually section 230 doesn't even lead to distributional liability, uh, which requires a, a, a bookseller to remove a book once it's been identified as defamatory. That's not even required under 230. What's fascinating is that there is a kind of 
convergence between right and left uh, political wings in the United States all joining in and hating Section 230, uh, which suggests that maybe there could be action. On the other hand, the grounds for criticism are quite different as are their proposed solutions. I think that there are some uh, signs that change will happen though. Uh, first of all, uh, the sky did not fall when there already was a revision of Section 230, the creation of the Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act uh, that requires removal of material that violates federal and, and state sex trafficking laws. And, you know, turns out the platforms are able to comply and the sky did not fall. Uh, secondly, uh, even if there is no law adopted this year or next year, the sheer fact of so much discussion, so many bills introduced, more than two dozen, uh, so many hearings means that many of the biggest companies are worried and they're developing some self-regulation uh, and that is all to the good. Uh, and it also shows that uh, the fears of uh, any kind of regulation are overblown, that a lot of the compliance can be done uh, algorithmically and will not break the bank. So whether the law changes or not, we're going to have change because it's simply an unsustainable situation. Thanks. You know, a lot has been covered about this idea of the platform sharing um, wealth that they generate based on news content with journalists. And we may come back to that a little later, but there was an aspect in your book that I just haven't written or read that much about that we're seeing have such an impact now when inclusion and equity in news coverage is such a troubling challenge for us in the industry and actually everywhere for all Americans. And that is how the digital algorithms block or narrow or limit access of news. And you, you surface in your book this idea that I haven't seen in that many places that in addition to a freedom of speech that there is a kind of right of the reader of the listener of the citizen to be able to access a variety of news sources. And you say, can exposure to a variety of views be a lawful requirement for algorithmic news? So now these algorithms are a secret, they're private, they surface some news sources, suppress others, they um, limit discovery of local news and they limit the discovery of news for any community outside the majority if they are just based on engagement, which sounds benign, but has an impact. Can you tell us about your ideas on how government regulation or requirements might be able to change that? As you wrote, algorithms are already used to narrow what people receive. They could be modified to expand what people receive. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, sure. Well, I do think that the phrase uh, algorithmic redlining borrowed from the discriminatory practices of banks and, and uh, real estate uh, dealers is appropriate. What we have is now high tech uh, discrimination. Uh, and it may not involve a conscious human being, but it does involve uh, algorithmics that compound the sorting uh, and the hierarchical arrangements in America. Uh, I do think that the people who've invented these algorithms had uh, uh, show a lot of creativity, but they've only had one benchmark, which is bottom line, how much money and their means to uh, making money is engagement and eyeballs because of the sale of ads. If there's another benchmark, the same ingenuity, the same talent that produced uh, these micro-targeting uh, techniques uh, of, of amplification uh, and, uh, and narrow casting, they can be used in other ways. And so there are really two aspects to your question. One, is it technologically possible to use the same kind of scaling up techniques enabled by algorithms to uh, broaden uh, the exposures that each of us get to varied points of view and, uh, and content? And the second uh, aspect of the question, is it legally and politically possible to require it? 
the first is easy. Technically, it is absolutely possible. I mean, just as one small piece of evidence, and I offered this in the book in 2017, a group of undergraduates at the University of Chicago created an entity they called Flipside, which is a national, a natural language processing algorithm, a machine learning program that is great at distinguishing meanings uh, even around politics uh, and is able to analyze key points and identify in comparison what's a counterpoint. This is four undergraduates did this in a couple of months, okay? It's technologically possible to use these uh, tools, machine learning and other algorithmic tools to sort content information along many, many, many different dimensions and to expose individuals to content that doesn't replicate and amplify what they've already seen, but shows them something different. Now, there will be some technical and political questions about along what lines should the difference be identified. Uh, it, I do think that the uh, uh, idea of the narrow band of pol political uh, viewpoints in America is only one way to sort viewpoints. I mean, another is just the geography of the author or of the subject under study. Another is uh, the, the size and scale of those who are reading it. And of course, there are identity markers, race, gender, class, disability, and many others. So I think there'll be important and valuable discussions about along what dimensions should people have the chance to see something different than what they uh, organically uh, choose or what they are prompted to see, um, but it's technically possible. Is it legally possible? Is it politically possible? Well, I, I prefer myself uh, voluntary rather than mandated such requirements, but if there will be no voluntary activity, if it's a competitive disadvantage for profit-making companies, and so there can be nudges, there can be tax credits, there can be subsidies. My goodness, the, the core algorithm that launched Google was funded by a National Science Foundation grant. We can use the same kinds of techniques to subsidize and fund the development of tools that will broaden our exposures. Um, and I do think that this should be coupled with making transparent uh, and operable by users the choice architecture of particular platforms. So we can opt out if we don't wanna see uh, a particular set of messages or particular dimensions. Um, so I think a combination of voluntary activity, uh, government nudges, and then frankly, uh, government oversight of the competitive structure so that these companies actually feel competitive pressure from startups and others that are offering alternatives to people. That would be necessary. And it is legal, that is definitely legal. And I think there's even political appetite for all of that. Anything that looks more like the government directly mandating, here's what everyone must see. No, I don't like that. And I don't think the first amendment would countenance it. That is a question, of course, for journalists whose one of the key roles is holding government accountable. How do we pursue these things and make sure we're retaining independence and that the, the you, you talk so um, clearly about how government has not only financially supported journalism in the US since the founding of the country, but actually actively shaped it through policy as well as finance. Um, so how, you know, we've kept this level of independence so far. How do you see that playing out in these proposals? Well, I, I, thanks for highlighting that. I mean, I think it is surprising to a lot of people in America and even people outside when they hear about our First Amendment, they assume therefore government can not get close to the media industry. Well, that's not true. And it's historically the opposite. Uh, ranging from the subsidies from the founding of the post office for uh, news circulation, all the way to the antitrust laws, uh, not to mention the licensing of broadcast and the oversight of cable. Um, I, I do think that uh, what is um, very important 
is insulating and separating uh, anybody who produces news and content from a, a government decision maker about what is that content. And I do think that public broadcasting shows us that there are many ways to do this. You can create uh, an entity that receives public dollars and has its own independent governance and is then, uh, that is the entity that distributes the money. You can use the tax code with tax credits and donations. So it's individuals who are uh, either making a donation that's tax exempt or uh, uh, running a company or an entity that is nonprofit and therefore uh, is, is getting a subsidy in essence from the government that distributes the choice making. It's not the government making the decision uh, uh, about where those resources go, it's individuals and private entities. So we, we're very familiar. We've developed these techniques historically. We can use them again and even more. Thank you. Um, I'm going to address one question that came up in chat from Barbara Talisman who said, what advocacy are we doing? What can, uh, what can happen now? What part should we play as INN members and news organizations? Barbara, we will address that in a breakout session. There is a lot going on on this front and we are part of a coalition pursuing some action. And we will talk about that a little later in the program. You'll see a panel discussion from some of those leading that action. Um, let's, I could ask you questions all day and talk about this book, but I wanna turn over. We have a lot of questions in chat. Shireen, do you want to um, help surface some of the, the questions being posted there? Yeah, I think this is really a question for, for both of you, but Martha noted that, you know, with the decline of traditional media and these news deserts, does that pose a business opportunity? And that is definitely something we're seeing at INN and startups. So maybe you could both address that, whether, you know, what's the opportunity? Where do we go from here? It's great. Sue, do you want to start? Sure, I'll just, I'll, I'll mention that we are now in the period of startups that's the fastest pace of news startups that we've seen in the nonprofit world since 2008, which is of course when the commercial industry really fell off a cliff. Um, and it is accelerating. We are seeing more individual donations and we are seeing um, individuals support news more broadly. So we are in this key period. And one of the things that um, I'm curious for, for Martha's thoughts on related to this is that we are seeing movements in governments in the EU, India, Australia, moving toward requiring platforms or requiring or inspiring platforms to share some of their funding um, with news producers. And Martha, I'm curious how you see that. You suggested this might happen voluntarily at a greater scale with or without government action. And how do you see that potentially supporting restoration of the field? I, do, I, I think that uh, there will not be one avenue here, but there are several possibilities. Uh, one is uh, the voluntary contributions, which are already starting uh, big platforms, uh, even some of them giving support here. Uh, understand that this is a matter of uh, the civic pride and the viability of the country. It's not uh, just always their own uh, business short-term interests, but long-term interests that uh, matter here. I also think that um, there, the antitrust rules are relevant about making space for competition. Uh, and there is a lot of interest there, and I predict we will see some developments, whether it's through the uh, Justice Department Antitrust Division or its modifications of the antitrust laws. The laws as they're written actually would allow much more action than there has been for some time. The courts have read the antitrust uh, laws to actually permit lots of concentrated uh, market power if the consumer doesn't pay. Well, here we come to that weird business model of the internet. No one's paying uh, at higher prices because no one's paying at all. Um, well, I think we are paying in our data and we need to understand that. And I think there are more and more lawyers who are beginning to understand that. Um, so antitrust law would, if, if enforced and if modified, uh, would create more room 
Um, I also think that there will be more partnerships. I think that the model that's represented by this very conference of people sharing and distributing um, uh, is a fantastic one. The model that ProPublica has to grow the uh, data analysis that then enables local stories. Uh, the model of the Associated Press. Um, I think there'll be many more new network possibilities that will allow for the circulation and sharing of, of information. So uh, there's another question. A lot of people, Professor Minow, had questions about Section 30 and kind of what, what the legal arguments might be. So setting aside the advocacy for the moment, um, one person says, if if, if isn't, isn't an algorithmic presentation actually a type of content creation? And is that way, is that one way to go? Or, uh, you know, what about the power of Google and Facebook and the big platforms to counter anything that we might do? So I think people are kind of curious about if we had to have a legal strategy, what, what would it be? <clears throat> well, section 230 is simply a, a provision of a statute. Legally, uh, that provision can be uh, modified in two ways. One is for judicial interpretation to modify it. And there have been already, I think, a fair number of critics of how the courts have interpreted it very broadly to exempt platforms from liability, even when they allow, uh, you know, ads for illegal uh, uh, materials. You know, that's nothing that's written in the statute that calls for that. Um, so there's judicial modifications and that calls for advocates and for journalists to expose it. And the second way is of course, amending the statute and the amendment process is underway in the sense that there are many proposals for modifications. I think that the most promising ones in my mind are uh, exemplified by a proposal by Ben Wittes and Danielle Citron who suggests that rather than getting rid of Section 230 immunity, it should be conditioned. It should be available on the condition that the platform does and then fill in a set of requirements. Uh, step up to the mediation uh, moderation requirements and making them transparent. Uh, step up to uh, an obligation to uh, to send funds to nonprofit news, step up to a set of obligations, and only then would that immunity apply. I think that's very promising, and I don't see any legal problem with it, and there might even be a political coalition for it. That makes sense. <coughs> Another question on a different tack, and I don't know how much you address this in the book, but someone asks, what is the perspective about the future of minority media? And, and we've seen in our work that typically minority media is often a for-profit, right? It may be like black owned or, or people of color owned, and there may be less inclination to go to a nonprofit model. So we're just curious, what do you think about the future and how does that fit in? I think this is actually in a, a, a really important question. And I think that uh, minority owned media is such a crucial part of the ecosystem and it's been uh, undercapitalized I think that the possibility of more partnerships is one way to build more uh, economic support. So you can imagine uh, other media actually saying, we need this, this material and we will contribute. Uh, another uh, avenue, and it's related to what you've said uh, about maybe reluctance to go the nonprofit mode, is the use of the beneficial corporation. So we have this emerging possibility of for-profit companies that actually are committed to a mission, have a double bottom line or a triple bottom line. And I think that uh, there will be more ex exploration of those kinds of corporate forms along with partnerships. Uh, a related question, uh, someone else asks if you could comment on, this is interesting, the danger of journalism that reports with a social justice mission. This is something we hear a lot, right? If we're accused of bias, how do we avoid the perception of bias? Um, what do you think about kind of coming at it from this public service mission? Well, when I said before that there is agreement that there should be reform, but the political points of view differ about what the problem is, this is one of the sore points. It's particularly uh, popular among uh, more conservative voices to say 
there is a bias in the media. It's a liberal bias. Um, I, I think there is uh, always a point of view, no matter who's writing, when or where or how. Um, but I think there are many who would say there's bias and it's uh, actually closing off uh, spectrums from the left. Um, I, I think that it's a very well-deserved concern. We should all be concerned about uh, the squeezing out or closing out of different points of view. And uh, that's why I am so interested in structural solutions that produce competition, that open up avenues for other voices. Um, I, at the same time, uh, I don't think it is ma manifesting uh, some kind of bias to say that there are stories that have not been covered in the past that need to be covered more. Or there are reporters whose voices have not been elevated and they need to be elevated. That's not bias. That's uh, actually, again, expanding the range of, of content and it's redressing exclusions that have uh, sadly marked uh, media and the whole country. Uh, Martha, I have a question too, if I may seize the mic. We've been seeing a lot of people starting their own newsletters and especially as a way to serve local communities. And of course, these newsletters are written, but they're not necessarily edited. I'm just curious what you think, if, where you see that it, it, as part of the solution mix or whether it gives you pause. <clears throat> You know, I'm 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 actually interested in this development, and I think that the uh, block by block local local news is something that is a welcome possibility enabled by the internet and the digital. I do think that uh, there are two risks. One is that uh, they will not find uh, readers or participants, uh, and it'll be. Uh, limited to a small group when there are important stories that should be spread. And the second uh, uh, risk is that there are disguised newsletters that claim to be from somebody in the local community, but are actually uh, reflecting a corporate interest or again, produced by a robot. Um, I think those are the big challenges going forward and the solutions, I don't have uh, easy short solutions, but they involve building networks that combine uh, the content, you know, the Reader's Digest version of the best hits from local newsletters, something like that, and participating in news bank stories uh, or news story banks or other kinds of ways to share and distribute. Um, uh, uh, having uh, larger media actually regularly surface stories from uh, local, hyper-local ones, that would be good. And as to the disguise, I think that that's where I part company with some people who think that anonymity is fine and disguising who is the producer of uh, content is fine. I think there should be disclosure and I think it should be required. Thank you. And everyone, we have just a few more minutes for questions. The session wraps at, at 12.30, so get them in the chat. Um, Martha, someone asks about what they call the hedge fund strip mining of the news industry. Obviously, we've seen a lot of stories about this. They Newspapers get bought, they get consolidated, sold off. Uh, where do you see that going? Uh, I think that it has been a source of attractive investment for private equity and other investment vehicles because of the subscription model. Uh, and there's a you know, predictable revenue stream, but it won't last because of the strip mining. The content uh, is, and the reduction of any content producers, the elimination of any staff means that who wants to read it? Uh, so it's self-defeating and it's very short term. I mean, this is part of a larger problem of why has American capitalism so elevated short term returns over longer term investments? Um, so where is it heading? Not in any good place. Uh, and I don't see a market solution. It's one of the reasons that I really do think of an important part of the mix here is got to be uh, some combination of nonprofit and uh, public uh, service uh, media. You know, that said, I do think that there are um, uh, possibilities of uh, both the hyperlocal and the national connecting in ways that was never true before, even the global. 
Um, and whether that will uh, involve private investment or again, require uh, public investment, I don't know, but um, the technologies, every technology, every technological advance has upended the media industry in this country. Uh, the telegraph, uh, the, of course, broadcasting. Uh, so we shouldn't be surprised. And that's why inevitably the government is involved because the government lays the rules around uh, how capital gets invested, what gets deductible, uh, what, what can be offset, what's treated as a capital investment, what's the governance structure of the, pri of the private companies, all of that. Those are government rules. And those are all tools that can be adjusted to alter the ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, we have a question, uh, back to the legal arguments again, um, to your point that if the First Amendment requires government intervention to support a free press, would that be read as a positive or a negative liberty? And I'm assuming the person means sort of freedom from freedom to. How would you frame that? Well, it is a really interesting fact that our Constitution, which is the longest in existence, continuously operating national constitution of a democracy in the world, it's at this point a pretty old constitution. And it's written before both world wars. It's written, obviously, before the internet. All the constitutions that have been written after World War II have positive rights, rights to education, for example. The U US Constitution has only negative liberties. It's a set of restrictions on the powers of the government. Uh, and that has actually not served us always well, take the right to education. We don't have a national right to education. Uh, it, it's hard to quite uh, make sense of this, but that explains a lot of the disparities of opportunity in America. I think on the freedom of speech, it's so interesting that the justices of the Supreme Court have acknowledged this in saying that the freedom from government censorship or limits on speech is not simply a freedom for the speaker or the journalist, it's also a freedom for the reader. And it, that right to have access to information could be viewed as a positive right, but I think it's more uh, appropriate to see it simply as another face of the negative liberty that the government should not be in the business of limiting what people see. Now, we live in, again, an era of a big government uh, that was never contemplated by the Constitution, the administrative state, uh, a country that spans the continent, uh, trains that cover the, the, the continent, not to mention broadcast and cable and internet. And for that, we have a bigger government. The government therefore is acting. I think that the distinctions between government action and inaction fall apart. When you already have the government acting, the question now is which way? What are the ground rules for the antitrust? What are the ground rules for consumer protection? What are the ground rules for capital uh, uh, treatment under the tax rules? the government's acting one way or the other. And so it's not about keeping the government's hands off. Okay, I'm gonna do one more question back to funding. Um, we've talked about the mix of public and private and obviously reader revenue is, is part of that as well. But a couple of people have surfaced the question about, is there an opportunity to make these distributors to have the Facebooks and Googles actually pay, pay pay for their content and given their power, how would we even you know begin to approach that? So I actually made a proposal like this when I first started writing about this about four years ago and people just laughed at me. And in the meantime, Australia has required it. The European Union is exploring it. England is exploring it. It's no longer a laughable proposition. And we do see voluntary payments by some of the biggest platform companies. Some uh, in order to feature on their own sites by having a special arrangement, but some are more of a philanthropic sort. And I think that's all to the good, whether it's voluntary or nudged. Uh, I think that there need to be contributions. I do want to couple that with the enforcement of the intellectual property laws. Uh, because the taking of intellectual property without compensation violates the Constitution. 
Martha, I think we are going to wrap on that very strong note. And I think you would have a lot of concurrence in this audience. Um, thank I you so really much. Want to thank you for writing the book, for being here with us today and exploring this. And um, we see many of these ideas getting traction. And I do believe your book's going to be very important in the in the public discussion of news and democracy and all that we're wrestling with. So thank you so much.